We are live. Hello, participants. I see you coming on in. So we're going to give this just a couple seconds for everybody to get in and get comfortable. So go ahead, grab, grab a beverage of choice, maybe wrap up in something cozy, get comfortable. And we're going to start here in just a second. Here we go. This number is still going. So I am going to go ahead. All right, let's start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our little virtual event space. My name is Allie, and I'm going to be the host for the evening. Um, and I am so, so excited to be introducing James Cruz and Roske here to celebrate the new anthology, How to Love the World. So before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so, so much for tuning in. And of course, for buying books, your guys' support really is what keeps this place going. And we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you come swing by and grab copies. Or if you're not local, we do ship. Shipping is just $3.50 for the first book and a dollar for every book after that. And I will be linking books in the chat so they should be pretty easy to find. Uh, while you are over on our website, I definitely recommend signing up for um, our newsletter and checking out our other events. Our newsletter is just a once a week, very short email. Uh, letting you know on uh, about fun bookstore events, our online book clubs, and exciting releases. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books, and that'll be just the quickest updates and recommendations. And of course, we do have kind of a good time over there. So go and see if there's anything in there that is useful to you. Uh, so we are here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions so if you have any questions which we very much hope that you do go ahead and leave those in the q a box they should be at the bottom or at the top of your screen um the q a box is different than the chat box the chat box is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other i see that people have begun to see it already <laughs> let you know chat Shout at us, we love that. But once it time, comes time for questions, definitely throw those in the Q&A so that we can easily find them. And I believe that that is all of the housekeeping that I have. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce James Cruz, the author of four collections of poetry, Telling My Father, which won the Cowles Poetry Prize, Blue Burl, Bluebird, Every Waking Moment, and The Book of What Stays, uh, which won the Raz Schumacher Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry. He's also the editor of popular anthology Healing the Divide, po Poems and ki of Kindness and Connection. His poems have appeared in Plowshares, The New Republic, and The Christian Century, and have been featured on Tracy K. Smith's podcast, The Slowdown. His work has also been reprinted in former U.S. Poet Laureate Ted Kuzer's weekly newspaper column, American Life in Poetry, which he has worked on with Ted Kuzer and which reaches millions of readers across the world. He teaches poetry at the University at Albany. Our second speaker tonight is Ross Gay, the author of The Book of Delights and a genre, a genre defying book of essays and four books of poetry, including his most recent, Beholding, a book, a love song to legendary basketball player, Julius Irving, as well as the catalog of unabashed gratitude, bringing down the shovel and against which. His book can be found, or his work can be found all over the place from Lit Hub to the New York Times to the Paris Review. He is a founding editor of the online sports magazine, some call it Fallen, and founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard. He has received fellowships from Kaveh Kahnem, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Guggenheim Foundation, and teaches at Indiana University. So tonight they're here to discuss the new anthology, How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope, which was edited by James Cruz and for which Roske wrote the foreword. Um, it includes hundreds uh, I includes 100 uplifting poems of gratitude by well-known and emerging poets, including Roske, 
Joy Harjo, Amanda Gorman, and many, many others. Um, so thank you both so very much for being here. I am excited to be a fly on the wall uh, for this conversation. If you need anything, give me a shout. That goes for everyone in the audience as well. I will be keeping an eye on that. Um, and I'm gonna leave you in their capable hands. So don't forget to throw your questions in the Q&A. And with that, welcome to both of you. <laughs> thanks so much, Allie. And uh, thanks to Third Place Books for having us. So. Um, we're here to talk about How to Love the World, um, this book that I spent the last year putting together and for which Ross Gay was so kind to write a foreword. Um, I haven't told Ross this, but I, I kind of think of him as the spiritual co-editor of this book because <laughs> so many of these poems are about delight and joy and uh, finding that especially during this last difficult year when um, joy and delight were in really short order for so many of us. And, um, and so I just wanna talk a little bit about um, the seed of this anthology, um, which really is just the past few years. I, I think a lot of people thought that I put this together kind of in response to the pandemic and the racial uprising last summer, but um, it actually came about sooner than that. You know, I was planning on an anthology of poems about gratitude and joy, just because we need more of that. And um, I think I had just read, Ross, your book of delights and um, had taught it to an MFA class. And so I was like geared up, like looking for joy and delight everywhere I could find it. And, um, and then the pandemic hit. And I think the need for um, poems that really foregrounded gratitude, joy, and hope seem to become more of a necessity for me uh, personally and then um, for just all the people in my life, my students. And so, um, so this anthology just came out of that um, practice of just looking for poems that kind of took me out of the moment, put me back in my body, grounded me in the world again. And, um, and this is the result of that. So I was hoping that Ross would start off by uh, reading his foreword and, um, and uh, kind of leading us into the anthology that way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's really nice to be with you, James, and good to be at Third Place Books. Um, and one day again in person, you know, <laughs> live, but we're live-ish. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm psyched to be here and to celebrate this lovely anthology. Uh, forward. I've been spending a lot of time lately thinking about witness, about how witness itself is a kind of poetics or poesis, which means making, by which I mean I've been wondering about how we make the world and are witnessing of it. Or maybe I've come to understand, to believe how we witness makes our world. This is why attending to what we love, what we are astonished by, what flummoxes us with beauty is such crucial work such rigorous work. Likewise, studying how we care and are cared for, how we tend and are tended to, how we give and are given is such necessary work. It makes the world. Witnessing how we are loved and how we love makes the world. Witnessing, witness and study, I should say. Witness as study, I think I mean. Truth is we are mostly too acquainted with the opposite with the wreckage. It commands our attention and for good reason, we have to survive it. But even if we need to understand the wreckage to survive it, it needn't be the primary object of our study. The survival need be, the reaching and the holding need be, the here, have this need be, the come in, you can stay here need be, the let's share it all need be, the love need be, the care need be. That which we are made by, held by, need be. Who's taken us in, need be. Who saved the seed, need be. Who planted the milkweed, need be. Who saved the water, need be. Who saved the forest, need be. The forest, need be. The water, the breathable air, that which witnessed us forth, need be. How we have been loved, need be, how we are loved, need be. 
how we need need be too, our radiant need, our luminous and mycelial need, our need immense and immeasurable, our need absolute need be. And that study, that practice, that witness is called gratitude. A gratitude need be. This is what I want to study. This is with whom. Wow, that's so beautiful. It's so nice to hear it in your voice, Ross. Thank you. I love that. I, I've been really moved too, especially by, um, by the part where you talk about, um, you know, not the, the brokenness and the fracturedness in our world not being uh, needing to be the focus of our study. And I feel like that gives us so much permission to just, you know, not look beyond it or not ignore it, but also to focus on other things maybe at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Focusing on what, what we love, how we're cared, you know, cared for, what, what keeps us, what keeps us as a way of tending also to our sorrows. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then also just tending to the earth, you know, I, I love that I sort of forgot, you know, we're coming off the heels of Earth Day here and, you know, the forest need be as well, right? We forget that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I just wanted to ask you too, um, do you have a lot of people who just assume that you're always delighted or always grateful because you write about gratitude and delight? Um, yeah, you know, I feel like some every once in a while people will kind of mistake, um, will mistake, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, a book called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, you know, it's kind of like, whoa, man, that's a, that's a title of a book of poems, <laughs> or like the book of delights, like, all right, yeah, makes sense, <laughs> you know, yeah. but you have an impression of such things, but um there, you know, there is what I would consider a misreading of, of my work sometimes or an underreading, um, which is that, um, you know, when I talk about joy um, and when I talk about gratitude, um, I'm, you know, joy the way I sort of imagine it is actually the, the reaching we do toward each other in the midst of what is devastating. That to me is joy as much as, you know, more than any like sort of um, um, not nice thing, you know, right. like, the, like the joyous thing, which is the profoundly beautiful thing, which is also the grave thing to me, is the way that we, we reach toward each other in the midst of, um, in the midst of the most profound sorrow, in the way that, you know, maybe we, we hold each other's sorrows together and what that sort of fabric makes, it becomes a kind of radiance that you know, takes us somewhere. Yeah. I love that, that idea that the reaching for each other in the midst of what's devastating is like, that can be a definition of joy because so many people think that joy is like um, the brief spurt of happiness, you know, or, um, you know, the, that Ali called this book of, of poems, like these are all uplifting poems. And I'm sometimes surprised by that because I think a lot of these poems are rooted in sorrow and, you know, and yet joy is like the flip side of sorrow and the two can coexist. And we don't really talk about that in our culture, that joy and sorrow can come like from the same spring inside. It's, you know, and that we can take in the sorrow of the world and be devastated by that and still feel delight or joy. I think, you know, that's, that's what, maybe people get confused by or what causes them to misread or underread certain poems. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, I, I think it's a kind of uh, <laughs> a youthful notion. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it's, um, you know, the less, the less patient or less kind way of saying it is sort of immature mm -hmm. idea, you know, that you could just, you know, that you could be a creature and not be in the midst of your dying, you know, or yeah. be a creature and be in the midst, not be in the midst of change, which will probably break your heart. If your yeah. heart isn't, you know, if your heart isn't already broken, which probably <laughs> like, oh, there it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or like an emotion can be totally pure. Like I'm only feeling sorrow right now, or I'm only feeling grief or 
only joy, happiness, love, like it's such a mix. And I think the broken heart allows all of it to be at the same time. Yeah. I was just, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on this thing with someone uh, who's in this book, actually, Noah Davis, we're writing about basketball. Yeah. Um, and I was just writing um, that, oh, you know, celebration is, is one of the one of the dialects of mourning, hmm. you know, um, like you said that, you know, they're, they're just like that. They're just like, yeah. That. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love that, you know, celebration can be a part of mourning because I think especially, you know, with everything that's gone on in the last year and, and, and in all of our lives, you know, it's, we get this idea that to mourn something, we have to be at a standstill or we have to be in inertia. And celebration to me suggests like connecting or reaching out, like you're saying, or finding the thing that brings you joy and doing that in honor of the person you've lost or the thing you've lost or whatever. Um, so I, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful notion, yeah. Um, well, why don't we, maybe I'll read a poem um, so I, for some reason, I was thinking about Alberto Rios's when giving is all we have, just that idea of, you know, the reaching out and the connecting. So, uh, when giving is all we have, one river gives its journey to the next. We give because someone gave to us. We give because nobody gave to us. We give because giving has changed us. We give because giving could have changed us. We have been better for it. We have been wounded by it. Giving has many faces. It is loud and quiet, big though small, diamond in wood nails. Its story is old, the plot worn and the pages too, but we read this book anyway over and again. Giving is first and every time, hand to hand, mine to yours, yours to mine. You gave me blue and I gave you yellow. Together we are simple green. You gave me what you did not have and I gave you what I had to give. Together we made something greater from the difference. So I'm just thinking too about this idea that of things coexisting, you know, we, we give what we don't have to give, or um, we might have been changed by something, or we are changed by something. Um, yeah, that all those possibilities exist when we're reaching out to another person. Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. in the midst of our giving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Would you like to read? I do one? Yeah, please do. <laughs> it's short. Um, it's a Lucille Clifton poem. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's called The Lesson of the Falling Leaves. The leaves believe such letting go is love. Such love is faith. Such faith is grace. Such grace is God. I agree with the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I love her so much. I, I just like, she writes these short, pithy poems and I, they just they move me so much and I I really thought like gosh this is such a, a tiny poem but there's so much in that poem and I just knew I had to include that yeah yeah it's an amazing yeah amazing poem yeah an amazing yeah. amazing poet oh my god yeah yeah so you're writing about basketball right now have you been writing poetry as well I mean how has the yeah. writing been during the pandemic you know, the writing, it's, you know, it's been interesting is that the, <clears throat> I've been writing um, quite a bit and I've been, have I been writing poems? I don't think I've been writing poems. Well, you know what? I've been, I've been very inclined to collaborate during the, during the pandemic. And so, yeah. like I mentioned, these basketball kind of exchanges, and then I've been working on, um, you know, just getting with, you know, folks who I'm studying with, you know, like writing kind of collaborative poems or, or even thinking about other, just like some thinking about projects, you know, um, 
that's been that's been one of my one of my main inclinations. Um, you know, started about a year ago was to be like I didn't even notice it until a little bit later. But I was like later I was like oh man I've been I'm always itchy to collaborate, but I felt yeah. a little extra itchy. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Um, my my friend Danusha Lamaris, who's also in this book, um, she she always says, because we're we're collaborating on a class that you're gonna be a part of later this summer. But um, she's like, you know, this is the year to do big risky things with people we love, you know, and and I just feel like that's it. Like we can't put it off anymore, you know. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's I funny. That. I just I just wrote wrote something just like that, you know, that sort of imagining what school is and like, or what class might be, or what living might be, running with others toward what you love. Yeah, that's it. no, that's I love that. I love that she said. Yeah, and it's so true. And I think you know, I the way I've often taught is sort of that, you know, like let's just do what we love and keep things loose and, you know, like listen to our intuition, remember what intuition is. And I don't know, I feel like we're, we're all kind of moving in that direction or I like to think so anyway, and um, that it, it could be a real change that comes within poetry and, and academia. Um, and I, I feel like I've had so many people contact me over the last year who, want to work on their poetry. Like, you know, I want to be a poet now, so how can I do that? And I think that's great that, um, that we're all being drawn to, to the things we love again and that we're passionate about and so easy to put those things off in, in the midst of the busyness of life. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So I'm going to read another poem. Um, I never know what I'm going to read. Um, so I kind of want to read this poem by January Gill O'Neill um, in the company of women. And this is, this is all about joy for me. And I've thought about this poem a lot. It's on page 102. And um, just in the midst of the pandemic, like we're all trying to take our joy to go basically, like find different ways to, different creative ways to make that joy happen, especially when we can't gather. So this is In the Company of Women by January Gill O'Neill. Make me laugh over coffee, make it a double, make it frothy so it seethes in our delight. Make my cup overflow with your small happiness. I wanna hoot and snort and cackle and chuckle. Let your laughter fill me like a bell. Let me listen to your ringing and singing as Billie Holiday croons above our heads. Sorry, the blues are nowhere to be found. Not tonight, not here. No makeup, no tears, only contours, only curves. Each sip takes back a pound. Each dry roasted swirl takes our soul. Can I have a refill? Just one more. Let the bitterness sink to the bottom of our lives. Let us take this joy to go. I really miss cafes also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> it's just such a great place. I mean, I, I, I remember in Book of Delights, you know, you're talking a lot about being out and, be, and writing in cafes and just observing people and that that kind of like seeping into whatever you're writing and whatever you're working on, that spirit and that kind of bustle gets yeah. in you. And I'm just, you know, I, I have a lovely studio here. I love my studio, but I want to be out, out in the world too, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> totally. Makes me nice very nostalgic at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, should I do one? Yeah, go for it. This is a Tess Taylor poem. There doesn't need to be a poem. It's called, that's the first line too. There doesn't need to be a poem for this sadness. Simply to breathe next to a stream that slips into the gutter near your house would be enough. To see next door in the graveyard the brown and yellow millipede bury itself below one granite stone, 
joining in the work of making soil, just as now the faithful oxygen still turns the copper headstone green, oxidizing to patina despite all. By luck, your own feathered alveoli still red in blood, your fine cell walls trade oxygen for carbon and sift the windy mix we call air. This happens going on invisibly, even if no one remembers how, and even if it seems that pain is a volatile molecule, grief bonding unpredictably to things. Now the late sun rims a cloud. You who watch that cloud, inhale, exhale. Mm. Oh, that's such a beautiful poem. Yeah, I know I chose that poem and I there was a reason, but just hearing it again, wow. And it's like joy and gratitude in a graveyard, right? Like, yeah, you know, exactly. in the presence of our dying, as you said earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was the process of um, like the gathering of, uh, of the anthology? It must have been fun and challenging. It's fun. It is so much fun. Like Naomi Shihab Nye, she's, she said she has an addicted to anthologies personality because it's just so much fun to like gather all these poets and these poems together. You feel like you're creating a community. Um, I guess I've always been like a hunter gatherer of poems, partly because I'm a teacher and so I'm just always sharing poems. And I think of every poem as being like an invitation or like open to prompts and um, so I have like all these files on my computer of just like different kinds of poems. And so I was going between all those poems and actually I was doing a lot of the work um, right before the pandemic, my husband and I were in Argentina. So we we're um, traveling a little bit in Patagonia and, um, and I was just like, you know, sitting outside in the sunshine and, you know, <laughs> looking at poems and like, you know, thinking about joy and gratitude and, um, and, and I think being in another culture too, like once you step out of this culture, you kind of realize what we've been missing here for, you know, a while, but especially like the last four years and it's a lot of joy and gratitude. And, um, and so I think that's partly why I was so driven to, to do that work there, but I reached out to people, you know, I, I, um, I knew there were certain people that I wanted to include and, so like Ted Kuzer, Ellen Bass, and um, Danusha Lamaris, and just reached out to my friends, the people I loved, and, and just like was on the lookout for poems that um, made me feel grateful and joyful and hopeful again. And, you know, there are a couple of pandemic poems in there, like uh, Kim Stafford's Shelter in Place, I think is a lovely, gorgeous little poem. And, um, so, you know, when you kind of attune your mind, I imagine you felt this like when you're writing Book of Delights, it's like suddenly you're looking for delight. Delight is finding you. And you say this in that book, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. these poems just kept finding me. It was really amazing. Yeah, oh, neat, neat. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. <clears throat> so should we do another one? Another poem? Yeah. Um, I think I'll read um, one of mine that are in here. And um, this one is called Winter Morning. And I remember, I still remember writing this. It was like a, a really chilly morning in Providence, Rhode Island, where I was living before. And I just, I didn't know anybody there. And I was having so much trouble being grateful, just feeling like present and grateful. And so I started off the poem that way. And then when the poem was done, I just, I felt so much better. And so this is like my argument for, do you wanna feel grateful? Do you wanna feel joyful? Like just start there if you don't feel that way and then see, look around you, take it in and see what, see what happens. So this is winter morning. When I can no longer say thank you for this new day and the waking into it, for the cold scrape of the kitchen chair and the ticking of the space heater glowing orange as it warms the floor near my feet. I know it is because I've been fooled again by the selfish, unruly man who lives in me and believes he deserves only safety and comfort. But if I pause as I do now, and watch the streetlights outside winking off one by one, 
like old men closing their cloudy eyes. If I listen to my tired neighbors slamming car doors hard against the morning and see the steaming coffee in their mugs, kissing their chapped lips as they sip and exhale each of their worries white into the icy air around their faces. Then I remember this one life is a gift each of us was handed and told to open. Untie the bow and tear off the paper. Look inside and be grateful for whatever you find, even if it is only the scent of a tangerine that lingers on the fingers long after you've finished peeling it. Mm, nice photo. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of neat, like part of the part of the part of the, the sort of steady or something of the poem is that it's it's it sees the steam rising off the coffee or it 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 joins, it does some reaching, you know, that takes yeah. itself, the speaker gets out of the kind of like interiority into this other kind of let me yeah. join in something. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I agree. It's almost like the poem's doing that work before I was able to do that work, you know, or the poetic voice is doing that for me. Yeah. And um, yeah. What was the feeling you were having? This is <laughs> might be too personal. What was the feeling you were having before when you felt unable to sort of like that the that the poem took you out of? You said you weren't feeling grateful, but was it yeah. was it loneliness? You said you didn't know anyone. Yeah, it was loneliness. And I'd say like, as far as sensation in the body, um, you know, it's like a heaviness, sort of darkness. You know, I probably hadn't slept very well, which is, you know, a lot where a lot of my kind of um, heaviness and um, difficult moods come from, because I don't, you know, I don't always sleep well. Um, and then there was a lightness because I think I was, you know, the poem was like, look, there's steam rising and like, there's that street light that's always like blinking on and off. And, you know, there they are slamming those car doors hard against the morning. And, you know, like, and then I'm like, oh, there's like, there's the, this morning's tangerine that's still on my fingers. And I'm like, oh yeah, I love the world again. I really, I love being here and having all of this available to me. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. The beautiful thing, the way, because it is sometimes when you when you don't impose on a poem, but you allow a poem sort of to bring you along, you know, <laughs> it's kind of magic. It's kind of magic. Yeah, it is, and you know, it's like I was even too worried. Like this, this poem lived in a file folder for a long time because I thought it was too cheesy. Like you know, oh, like this life is a gift. Like oh, that's that's too much. Like. You know, and then someone read it and they were like, oh my God, like you, you need to like do something with this. So, yeah. you know, it's, you, you have to just trust the poem, I think sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see, I'm gonna read that, um, put my poem in here. Yeah. Uh, which is? You're on 74, I think. Yeah, you got it, thank you. Um, yeah, it's called Wedding Poem. And this really, <laughs> it's really, my friend was like, hey, you got to read a poem at our wedding. And I was like, okay. And of course, being me, I was like, I woke up the day of their wedding. I was like, God damn, I got to write a poem. <laughs> <laughs> wedding Poem for Keith and Jen. Friends, I am here to modestly report. <laughs> so that's when I say friends in a poem, I like laugh now. <laughs> I'm like, here comes for us. <laughs> friends. I am here to modestly report seen in an orchard in my town, a goldfinch kissing a sunflower again and again, dangling upside down by its tiny claws, steadying itself by snapping open like an old timey fan, its wings again and again, until swooning, it tumbled off and swooped back to this very same perch where the sunflower curled its giant swirling of seeds around the bird and leaned back to admire the bird's plumage, to admire the soft wind nudging the bird's plumage. And friends, I could see the points on the flower's stately crown soften and curl inward as it almost indiscernibly lifted the food of its body to the bird's nuzzling mouth, whose fervor I could hear from oh 20 or 30 feet away and see from the tiny hulls that sailed from their good racket 
which good racket I have to say was making me blush and rock up on my tippy toes and just barely purse my lips with what I realized now was being simply glad, which such love, if we let it, makes us feel. Oh. <laughs> That is so great. First of all, I love that you use the words old timey and tippy toes in a poem. I feel like this gives us all permission I to agree. use these words now. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So you woke up that morning that you had to write a poem for the wedding. And is did you see it that morning or was this like a moment that you were drawing back from? from no, I was watching. I was like, oh, come on. I got to find a poem in the orchard today. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like looking around and I was like, oh, thank God, look, there's a bird. <laughs> there's a bird on the <laughs> sunflower. But it was, you know, it was like, um, it was kind of like, it seemed not, not totally different. Like I was kind of, I had a job and my job was to go make a poem for my friends. But it kind of like made me look in a certain kind of way. Like I knew I was going to go to the orchard. My, my beloved friends, we did a lot of work in the orchard together. Um, and uh and being there, kind of looking around, like, where's the poem? Where's the poem? And then, oh, look at that. <laughs> this flower and this bird are getting it on, you know? It's like, <laughs> that's a poem. That's a poem. <laughs> that's a wedding poem. <laughs> yeah. That is great. That is great. I mean, you, you recreated so well, so I'm not surprised that it was like, right there in front of you, you know, the pointed crown and yeah. just like the the sound too. Like, I think it's it's such a multi-sensory poem, you know, like you're, you're inviting the reader into the sound, the sight, just all of it, you know, yeah. we're there with you. So yeah. yeah, that's great. But I love, it's like, yeah, you know, some, some days you have a job and yeah. it's like, you know, the job is to create something from nothing or something that didn't exist. And we're like, you know, the morning in my poem, my, my job was to try to like be a little more grateful for my amazing privileged life. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and luckily the poem allowed me to do that. <laughs> right, right, right. The poem showed you how. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lucky thing when you can, uh, like that morning, my job was to make a gift for my friends. <laughs> yeah. Pretty lucky. Yeah. And what a great job. What a great job to have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think too, like, you know, it's the beauty of poetry that I, I feel like we're all getting in touch with these small moments that we're, we're able to have now. You know, like a lot of my students tell me like, oh, I went outside and I like, I went on a hike and I saw, you know, birds and I heard, you know, for the first time. And, um, and I feel like the beauty of a poem especially is that it allows us to capture a moment for ourselves. And then we get to relive it over and over again whenever we're sharing it. And then like you're, you were offering this moment as a gift to friends. So there's like this whole other layer of giving that I think is such a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's neat. this year I've been, um, oh, so interesting. Yeah, one, this year, one of the poets I've been, among, along with Lucille Clifton, one of the poets I've been really kind of back in was uh, Jean Valentine who died on December 29th, I think. Who was such a poet of, you know, for the most part kind of, like in size, you know, like not long poems, just like, just, just so full. And, and I was sort of like, oh, reading Jean Valentine and reading Lucille Clifton, I was like, oh, part of the reasons, part of the, re one of the reasons I turned to poetry is because I want people to help me hold the mysteries. Yeah. You know? And, um, and that's another thing, like in terms of a gift, it's also a poem sometimes it really can kind of hold for us mysteries that, yeah. that we can hold by ourselves you know that's right yeah yeah and you know just going back to what we said before like holding the mystery of all these things that are coming up or coexisting at the same time you know the the love and the sorrow the heartbreak and and the joy and and it's such a you know even a longer poem is such a small container really for that and yet that, that's what it does and, and it's it's miraculous yeah I haven't looked at her poems in a, in a while and um but I, I love how how contained they are 
but also like, you know, they're, they're just like these, these windows, you know, like that you just slip through into another world. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe we should do one more poem and then we'll maybe take some questions. Um, let's see. So um, this one is one that I've really loved sharing with people over the last year. And uh, this is by a friend of mine, Laura Grace Weldon. It's called Compost Happens. This is on 122. Little tongue in cheek title there. Compost Happens. Nature teaches nothing is lost. It's transmuted. Spread between rows of beans, last year's rusty leaves, tamp down weeds. Coffee grounds and banana peels foster rose blooms. Breadcrumbs scattered for birds become song. Leftovers offered to chickens come back as eggs, yolks, sunrise, orange. Broccoli stems and bruised apples fed to cows return as milk steaming in the pail, as patties steaming in the pasture. Surely our shame and sorrow also return, composted by years, into something generative as wisdom. Yes. She makes it sound so easy, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's great. Um, and let me see. You know, I'm going to do that name with Shev Naipong in there. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. We forget about the spacious, it's called Over the Weather, <clears throat> Over the Weather. We forget about the spaciousness above the clouds, but it's up there. The sun's up there too. When words we hear don't fit the day, when we worry what we did or didn't do, what if we close our eyes, say any word we love that makes us feel calm, slip it into the atmosphere and rise. Creamy miles of quiet, giant swoop of blue. Mm. Yes. Again, like a shorter poem, but so much space in that poem. And yeah. so just, I, I think of that poem as like this big embrace, like these big open arms. Yeah, yeah, so spacious. Yeah, very nice. All right, shall we head over to some questions? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> thank you. Wonderful, of course. Thanks for uh, reappearing. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so Julie would like to know how you connected for this anthology. Yeah, so it was just over email. And um, I think uh, Todd Davis, another poet, um, he connected us, maybe it was Noah actually, because he and his new wife, I know, just randomly showed up here in Vermont, you know, I was sitting in the house one day and I'm like, what, where, what is, who is here? And so they just walk up and we had tea on the sun porch. So, um, so maybe, maybe they connected us, um, but we just mostly handled it over email. And, um, and so it's, it's good to see you in semi person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think, like I said earlier, um, you know, reading Ross Ross's amazing book, which please, I, I feel like everyone I know already has a copy, but if you if you don't have a copy, if you haven't read it already, please, it will make you feel better. You'll just feel better, and you'll go around like finding delight, finding kindness, which is what happened to me um, after I read it for the second time um, over the pandemic, <laughs> and. Uh, so, you know, that book was really influential and I, I just felt like, you know, that these books were similar in spirit. So Rebecca, um, Rebecca says, thank you to glorious human beings. I'm struck by how these poems spring from a deeper contentment that's both rooted in the world and beyond it. They're not candy store high, but the wild honeysuckle plucked from a dying bush. Can you speak to this and perhaps share any of your practices to reach into that wellspring? Hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I just I love I love the honeysuckle image. I'm I'm just like kind of intoxicated with that right now, but um, I don't know. I think it's it's really like we were kind of saying earlier, um, just trying to get out of the head and um, get out of the interior space, and um, being in the natural world is is one way that that happens for me. Like. You know, it can be something as simple as just feeding the birds in the morning or like we have a flock of crows who live around us that we um, sometimes feed peanuts and, you know, little bits of bread too. And, you know, we're like on a schedule with these crows and it's just like connecting to something larger or something different. Um, I feel like maybe allows me to stay in touch with a more childlike or like joyful space inside that is able to receive these things um, or these images. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the ways that are, um, the ways that we can have practices by which our, um, the boundaries, the boundaries between what we consider ourselves and not ourselves start to diminish, you know? Mm -hmm. So what are the ways that, and, and one of those ways is, is like, you know, gratitude actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if, if we started thinking about, if we, you know, you could never, you could never in one life uh, say gratitude for everything that has made your life possible. You can never do it, you know, which makes it such a good reason to try, you know, <laughs> you can never do it. And I wonder if that's like, and again, like that, that kind of, to me, like the, even, yeah, that, that sort of honeysuckle, you know, um, on a, on a bush that's, you know, maybe dying, um, honeysuckle, one of my favorite smells, um, on this planet, um, that acknowledgement, like the sort of un, unending acknowledgement, which is to say, you have made me possible. You have made me possible. You have made me possible. Meaning the tree, you know, and meaning the the microbe in your gut, and meaning the the skin on your body, and meaning you know your mother, or whatever you know, and um, that that that's kind of you know that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. How we sort of how do we cultivate this this practice of that that our indebtedness runs mycelially, you know, yeah. our need that our need need be, you know, it, it is uh, more, we, more we pay attention to our need, it feels like the more, you know, the, the distance between us, sort of the artificial distance between us starts to become evidently artificial. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's why I love that word mycelial um, because you can't necessarily see those connections or they're, they're not visible. And yet we are each connected in those ways. I, I really, I truly believe that. And, um, and so that is what makes the gratitude completely, you know, impossible to capture for everything that's contributed to our lives. And that, you know, allows us to live and allows us to live in a certain way too, and to do what we do. Yeah, and, and I'm interested too, you know, I, I don't know as much about the science, but just like, scientists are working with gratitude now and, you know, realizing like, you know, it's not news necessarily, but like the more each day that you practice looking for things that you're grateful for and articulating that, whether it's in a poem or a journal or just telling someone else and saying why you're grateful for it. Like there's something about that that situates it more in the body and allows you to hold on to it um, than, just saying like, oh, I'm, I'm grateful for my house, my family, you know, like finding new things every day, I think is, is that practice. Um, and like you're saying, Ross, like trying to, 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 to say gratitude for every single thing over a lifetime, it's impossible. And why not die trying? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Bruce would like to know if this book is out already, which I can answer. Yes, it is. It came out at the end of March. Uh, I'll Give me just a second and I will throw that link back in the chat so you can find it and click on it. Um, and then let's see, Berta would like to know what the name of the poem 
uh, Ross read that was about the cemetery. What was that called? That was Tess um, Taylor's one. Yeah, Tess Taylor's, and I think it's There Doesn't Need to Be a Poem. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's like the okay. next, the last one in the book, I think, or close. Wonderful. Thank you. And then, so Bruce is, uh, so he's wondering, um, he says, I'm sure there's a worry that um, it's all, and I'm assuming that he means here gratitude and hope. Writing about gratitude and hope feels cheesy. Um, how, is there a way to balance that with something else, etc.? cetera? Mm. Yeah. You know, I heard this great quote. I, I can't remember the teacher's name, but she was a meditation teacher. And, and I think she said something like, if you can't be cheesy, you can't be free. And I just like, I was like, yes, that's it. That's, it. that's all I need. Um, yeah, I think maybe if you're, if you're worried about kind of being seen as being hip or um, being seen a certain way, then then it might be worrisome to write about gratitude and hope. But I don't know. I think it just has to come naturally. And you know, like I said before, there are many poems in here that I think of as as really uplifting, and yet they're they're about deep sorrow. Like you know, there's um, there's one poem by Lynn Knight. I think it's called In the Third Year of My Mother's Dementia. And she talks about caring for her mother who, you know, is going deeper and deeper into dementia. And then all of a sudden she's looking out the window and she sees this flock of peacocks and it's just like beauty for no reason. And it's like, that's the uplifting piece. And, and I think the poem ends with something like, you know, this idea that beauty doesn't fix anything in particular and yet it fixes everything, you know? Um, so I guess I don't worry too much about that. You know, there, I think one reviewer said something like, you know, it was comparing the book to the chicken soup for the soul series and like it had a whiff of chicken soup to it. And I'm like, that, that's great. I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> a whiff of chicken soup in this book, you know, that's, that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah. 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 If I were to say anything about that, it would be, um, uh, you know, like, uh, again, like the sort of adult expressions of things like gratitude are, um, to me, it's like, you're also talking about, you're talking about death, you know? Yeah. You're yeah. not, you, you know, so I think, I think what, like imitating the feeling of gratitude or imitating the idea of the feeling of gratitude or something like that, performing a thing is, is one thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when you're, like sort of deeply contending with what this what this thing is, um, um, this gratitude or this joy or whatever, it's it's just it's 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 grave. It's actually grave. You mm. know, that's the thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So well said. So, Hope would like to know. Do you find, speaking of the wedding poem, uh, do you find that most poems start with an image or with language, a phrase or sound, or just a glance off to the side? And then thank you. I appreciate both of your work so much. <laughs> hmm. That's a good question. Do most poems start? I don't know. You know, I'm so not that person. Like, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Some poems do. Some poems start with like a phrase. Some poems start with an image. Some people say a hey, poem always has to end on an image, and I'm always like, none of it. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't go for any of it. Yeah. Uh, or I go for all of it. Whatever. Um, yeah. 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 I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't. I can't answer that. I don't know. Can you answer that question in a satisfactory way? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not satisfactory. Um, yeah, I, I was just, I, I didn't put it quite in that way, but in my head, I'm thinking like, I'm not that guy either because it's such a mystery to me. I mean, I really don't know. Like sometimes I hear a voice that sounds like something I wanna write and, and maybe sometimes that comes from an image. Like, 
you know, yesterday I was looking at my husband's dirty socks, like lined around the edge of the hamper, like he was going to wear them again, but you know, he's not. And like, why are they lining the edge of the hamper? And so that sparked something. And, um, and yeah, so I guess that's an image, but I also heard uh, a line. So I think there's never a formula. And I, I think what what I try to do is just walk around being really open and, um, you know, like reading poems that get me going. And, you know, like the poems in this book, they all start in different ways and, and they all begin with um, different subjects. So, um, yeah, I just think there's no formula. And when I learned that for myself, I, I think I was a much happier poet because I always thought there, you know, there could be a formula or there might be a way to like always make that poem happen. And it's it's such a messier process than that. It's like gloriously messy. Yeah, it's a little bit like once you know how to do it, you know, once you know exactly how to do it. Yeah. Why do it? <laughs> it's then it's harder to be led toward the thing that a poem is trying to sort of coach you up on. Yeah. Yeah, to be led and and to just follow the poem. Yeah. I think it's so much more thrilling. Yeah, because yeah, if it was a formula, like no one would do it once you once you knew how to how to get that, you know, so-called answer. So Karen would like to know who are some of your favorite poets? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, a lot of them are in here. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, you know, Charles Wright pops into, into my head. Um, as someone who I, I've just been reading recently and and he's not necessarily an uplifting guy. You know, I feel like he's always writing about death, like just sitting in his backyard, kind of contemplating life, writing about death and uh, the natural world. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I studied with Ted Kuzer in Nebraska and he just like, he reading him has really taught me how to see the world and, you know, to uh, just like reading Ross has also done, like how to find delight in really simple, like radically small things. Um, so I feel like he's, he's a great example, but th there are just so many good poems and good poets out there. It's really hard to choose. Yeah. I love, um, yeah, I'm the same. I love, um, I mean, Clifton came up, Jean Valentine came up. Um, poet Adeseli Skirmai is a poet who I just love. Um, Patrick Rosal is a poet who I just love. Um, Emnor Basie Phillip is a poet who I love. Um, and I'm astonished by um, Joy Harjo. Yeah. Is a poet who I just, you know, I don't know if I would have ever learned how to write a poem without reading her poems. Um, mm. June Jordan is a poet. Um, yes. It's just yeah. so important to me. Audrey yeah. Lord. Yeah, it's on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah, they've all been important. I mean, it's sort of like what you were saying about the the mycelial, like, you know, these, these rootlets connecting every poet to every poem that you've ever written. That's yeah. like we... You know, you could never repay that debt to every poem. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So Kelly is wondering if James, you can tell us more about the online class you'll be teaching later this year. Yes, yeah. So Ross is gonna visit with us. Um, and the, the class is with Danusha Lamaris. She and I are teaching that and we're calling it uh, Poetry of Resilience and um, basically just using poetry as a tool for navigating these difficult times. And, you know, basically this is an extension of what I said earlier, Danusha mentioned, like this is the year to do um, big risky things with people you really love. And so 
we were like, you know, just made a list of all the poets that we would want to hang out with and can't obviously right now. And so Ross is on the list, Naomi Shiab Nye, Jane Hirschfield, Ellen Bass, uh, Nicole Brown. And, um, and we just wanted to hang out with these people and, you know, glean a little wisdom from them. And then ourselves, like just talk poetry because I've never actually met Danusha in person and we've only connected over Zoom or done readings and things like this. Um, and we realize that every time we start talking, we just start talking about poetry and, you know, it feels like we're doing a podcast or something. And, and we just realize like, we need to like do something with this. So um, we're, we're doing something that we love together. So I see that Danusha put in an email address to contact in the chat. So all of you go check out the chat and you'll find that there. Um, so we are reaching the end of our evening together. So I have a couple more questions. This is from Stephen. Uh, Ross has written, I forget where exactly, but I read the quote every day, or I read the quote every day before I teach. The ice is melting everywhere, and I'm supposed to employ the method of teaching that is part of the same system that got us here. I can't do it anymore. We have to figure out different ways to be together. I was wondering if Ross and James could speak a bit about how they approach teaching, whether in a classroom or through poetry, and how to bring gratitude and grief too into pedagogical encounters. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I could say a little bit about that. Um, um, and I was sort of thinking a little bit back to the a couple questions ago about, you know, um, about, you know, people thinking, you know, I'm a, like a, am I like always delighted or whatever? <laughs> And, and what follows with that often is like, are you optimistic? And, um, and I'm not, I'm not. Um, and, and I'm not pessimistic either, you know? I just sort of think I'm like sort of, you know, trying to witness, trying to, just trying to witness. Um, but my, the way that I think of teaching in the last bunch of years, I sort of, I sort of started getting like, you know, the, the models of teaching that are hierarchical, that are about, that are impositional, that are, um, that are about fixing the word fixing, hmm. um, have become to feel not only like tedious and boring, um, but kind of violent, you know, kind of brutal, brutal to endure and brutal definitely to sort of inflict, though I'm very good at inflicting it. You know, if someone asked me to like brutalize their poem, <laughs> I wouldn't do it anymore, but I could. I wouldldn't do it because it's boring to me, but I could. I could be like there's a poem, you yeah. know, and um, it would be, you know, it'd be a boring poem because it'd be like how I know how to make a poem, you know, as opposed to how someone else doesn't know how to make a poem, which is very interesting. Um, but i've been I've been trying with the folks that I study with, you know, the people who who are students here in the MFA program or in the undergraduate program, trying to figure out ways, instead of um, instead of perfecting anything or um, there was a question about a craft, you know, if, if making a poem were a formula, it would be a craft, not art. And I think I think that, that that's kind of tangentially what I think, but not quite exactly because even the word craft, and I get this from Gabby Cavalcaresi, hmm. craft is a boat, you know, a craft is a ship, you know, a craft is some vehicle. and um, and so in a way, the question is like, what is the vehicle toward or what is the vehicle doing and how is the vehicle being sort of utilized or something like that? But to me, classrooms are places where basically, um, like my hope is two things. One is that talk about craft. I want us to figure out how to, um, how to, what our metaphors are doing. You know, I want us to sort of train our imaginations. And in doing that, I mean, or toward that end, which is not an end, which is never an end, I guess. I want to, to try to de make the classroom, I hope with other people to try to make the classroom a place not of mastery, but mm -hmm. of study, you know, not a ma of mastery, but of, of, of play actually, you know, yeah. play and practice. 
and the um so and, and you can hear in saying that like uh, collaboration collaboration is what i'm interested in and you know like because i'm not like you know i'm not i'm not teaching to make to get people to be excellent um I'm, I'm teaching so that we can practice caring for one another. Yeah. That's it. You know, I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, but, and, and that is a, that feels like a, uh, it's a pragmatist's approach actually to teaching, you know, mm -hmm. um, because, because I'm not an optimist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of, considering what is the world we want it to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah, and it seems pragmatic because, you know, that helps to create the world that you want to be a part of. And it's less painful um, and it just feels better to teach in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I would have said the same thing 10 or 15 years ago either, um, you know, but but it's it's similar for me. And I really believe in a collaborative environment. Like I'm not the authority. I really, poetry is still a mystery to me. And so like, I can't teach you how to write the poem that you're meant to write. I can like show you that there's a path <laughs> and there are all these stepping stones and everything. But um, so it's very collaborative. And when I'm with groups, like my, my guiding force really is vulnerability and, you know, that doesn't mean like oversharing or anything like that. It just means like sharing this space vulnerably with, you know, 15 or 20 um, other people and and just really genuinely showing up and, and admitting to limitations and admitting to what I don't know, which is vast and, um, you know, just exploring things together. And I, I really love actually the act of writing together in a group and just doing a lot of like automatic or in the moment writing so that people get less afraid of their imaginations or their intuition and what's gonna show up on the page because magic will happen. Like I was just, even on Zoom, it's better when you're in the same physical room together, but even on Zoom, it can happen. Like I was writing with a class yesterday and we were writing about things we missed during the pandemic and every single person had an image of someone smiling in their poem. I mean, it was amazing. And it's like, yes, of course, this is what we're all like bodily missing when we're out in the world, smiles. And, um, and like images recur when you're writing in a group together, that's the mycelial thing. And so it's such magic to be with other people. But if you start putting up barriers and if you start pretending to be the authority or like Ross was saying, inflicting violence on another person's creation, um, then you instantly like you cut off any uh, any chance of real connection or authenticity. And um, so I, I really believe that the act of writing, whether it's in a, like traditional workshop or whatever, it's really just about practice. And, you know, like, you will be the best judge of what your own poem is. You just may not be that best judge yet. It just takes time to get there. So I, I could go on and on about this, but but I love that question. I think it's a really good one. I, I love that, those answers. Thank you both so very much. I think we've reached the end of our time and I think that's a good place to stop anyways. But Jennifer, I see you in the questions. Uh, yes, there will be a recording for people who have missed this live. Um, it will be on our on our um, YouTube channel, which is um, here. If you just search Third Place Books on YouTube, you will find us. Um, and I think that this is where we, we end our evening. So thank you both so so very much for being here this was such a wonderful discussion um we i could have listened to you talk for hours um the rest of you thank you so much for showing up for tuning in and of course come on in and buy some books tweet us uh, at third place books let us know what you thought and of course if you do come in shout at a bookseller tell them that you were here and that you loved it and that i think is where i will leave you so good night everyone and thank you thank thanks you. everyone <laughs>
拜拜。